If you were stranded on a remote island and hunted by a giant carnivorous sea monster, what would you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made by our shipwrecked tourists, try to make better decisions, and ultimately attempt to beat the sea beast in Sweetheart. Getting stranded on a gorgeous tropical island with endless white sand beaches sounds like the type of vacation we could all use right about now. Unless, of course, the guy from The Shape of Water just happens to live in a deep hole off the beach and comes out to stalk you when the sun goes down. Too bad Hadley from the cabin in the woods isn't here. He'd finally get to see that cooler macho mermaid he always dreamed of instead of whatever floppy monstrosity this is. Surviving on a deserted island is right up there with the zombie apocalypses and global plagues, a scenario we all plan for, hoping it never actually happens. Now that it has, let's see if we can survive. It's day zero. Following a shipwreck, survivor Jen washes ashore a small jungle island in the Fiji archipelago, where Wearing a life jacket and a backpack. She notices a body in the surf nearby and rolls it over to find it's another guy from her boat named Brad. Brad is unconscious and bleeding from a jagged shard of coral embedded in his abdomen. Jen removes her life jacket, tosses Brad's flare gun down, and drags Brad up the beach. Unsure of what to do, Jen calls for help. When no one comes, she rips the coral out of Brad's stomach and presses her shirt to the wound. She rushes into the jungle to look for water. When she finds a coconut, she bangs it with a sharp rock, accidentally spilling most of the liquid when she picks it up. She returns to Brad to find he's died while she was gone. I am getting serious stranded deep vibes here. Jen has no survival skills, no experience with nature, and as we'll find out later, no history of actually being able to fend for herself. If only Bear Grylls was here to save us. Washing ashore on an island is just lucky. We don't know where her original boat wreck happened, how far away from here it happened, or why she and Brad ended up so far away by themselves. Before Brad dies, he asks her if she saw it, so maybe the monster already living here was involved. Who knows? What we do know is that Jen is half-assing everything right now. Like I said, she doesn't know how to do anything, and honestly, <laughs> neither would most of us. Here, dragging Brad out of the water is obvious, but she should be keeping a close grip on anything and everything they have at their disposal. She needs to get Brad beyond the tide line and then go grab the flare gun before it drifts away. We all saw Castaway. You never know when a piece of VHS tape or an ice skate is gonna save your life, but we do know that flares are insanely valuable out here. Brad is pretty screwed, given the context of the story. The 300 islands and 540 islets of the Fiji archipelago are scattered across 1 million square miles of ocean. Even if rescue were coming, it's possible he would die of infection or bleed out before they got there. Regardless, the general wisdom says you you shouldn't pull impaled objects out of wounds because they may be blocking vital arteries from bleeding out. Here, even if Jen were going to try and remove the coral, she needs to leave it in until she has the supplies to try and handle it properly. Hot water, clean cloth, and maybe even a fire going just in case she has to try and cauterize the wound. Once she removes it, she has to be the one to apply pressure to his wound. Brad is simply too weak to apply it hard enough. I'm not pointing fingers, but <laughs> by pulling it out and leaving him, she likely killed him quicker, which oh, may be a blessing in disguise, all things considered. As for the coconuts, they're an excellent source of fluids, especially because coconut water contains electrolytes, which help keep you better hydrated. But honestly, giving coconut water to this guy is like giving coconut water to Wade from Saving Private Ryan. Dude is pale from all the internal hemorrhaging. Water ain't gonna help much besides make his passing less painful. Regardless, instead of using a rock like this to break it and then spilling, she would have been better served by wedging the sharp rock into the husk and then using a second stone to tap the sharper stone deeper until it penetrated the shell. This would keep the opening small and prevent spillage. She would also want to do that because after it's empty, she could fashion a leaf funnel and use the empty coconut as a canteen for rainwater. She should also be doing all of this sitting next to Brad, not over here in the forest. He may need immediate help, and when she does crack that coconut, there's less chance of spilling it, carrying it six inches to his mouth, rather than 50 feet. When trying to give fluids to a wounded person, you also shouldn't just pour liquid into their mouth without warning them. They need to be conscious so they can prepare to swallow and reduce the risk of choking. Of course, now that he's dead, it doesn't make much of a difference. The only sensible thing to do is loot his corpse. While Jen's getting unplugged on a 
Fiji Island, you need to be getting plugged by our sponsor Raid Shadow Legends. Traditional gaming wisdom suggests PC is master race, consoles are for unwashed laborers, and mobile gaming is for clod hoppers. This is pure bigotry. Sure, I game on a high-end custom-built PC, but even I can't disparage the need for the accessible, light-hearted, sweat-free gameplay that Raid delivers. I know what you're thinking, Mr. Nerd. How can I engage in Mortal Kombat with these baby smooth hands that haven't wielded anything larger than a vegetable knife? Fear not. Raid's currently running a special Deliana Chase event. Just log in and play Raid for seven days between now and July 20th, and the Raid gods will send their newest, mightiest free warrior, the legendary champion from the High Elves faction, Deliana. Deliana's a strong support champion, which you need to keep your noob team alive until they become battle hearted. You don't need to be worthy of her. Any skill level can summon Deliana for free. But if you're a new player, you can also enter the promo code MYDELIANA to get 50 XP brews so that you can instantly get Deliana to a max level 50, as well as a ton of silver. You're going to need her for the Summer Solstice event, Path of Light, which has three awesome reward paths to explore. They also added new champs and skins for Trunda Guilt Mallet. Click my link in the description or scan my QR code to get a free epic champion, Virgis. 200,000 silver, one energy refill, and one XP boost, and one ancient shard. Unique bonuses were $30. All this treasure will be here. Jen walks the perimeter of the island, but doesn't find anyone or anything else there. In the jungle, she stumbles upon a campsite. In a bag hanging from a tree, she finds expired pills. In a cooler, she finds glass Coca-Cola bottles that suggest these people were stranded here back in the early 90s. She also finds a thermos and a box full of shells, cards, and a matchbox with eight matches. Finally, she finds a piece of tent cloth and a backpack containing a teddy bear, a Nintendo Game Boy, and a book of scary stories. This doesn't look good, but maybe the family made it out of here alive. Yeah, let's go with that. A lot of survival guides use the scout acronym STOP when assessing a crisis. STOP think, observe, and plan. This prevents panic and wasted action in the crucial first few hours after an event like this. Surveying the island perimeter feels like a good step here. It allows Jen time to exercise out her fear and informs her of the general size, flatness, and emptiness of the island. It would have sucked to set up camp only to find a sandals resort on the other side a few months later. Before scouting the island, I would have done a quick inventory of the supplies I had with me and made sure to move everything of value to the the tree line in case this island has larger tides. Later, we learn she has a bunch of stuff in that backpack of hers, including a hat, sunglasses, headphones, a diary, and a pen. That pen could come in handy as a makeshift blunt instrument. That cooler could be used to collect rainwater, and those sunglasses might help her make a fire using the sun's rays. This is why every survival game you've ever played relies heavily on inventory management. I would also take Brad's shoes, as Jen seems to be walking through this tropical jungle full of venomous things and sharp objects with bare feet. I would also carry a rock, heavy branch, or even the flare gun for protection until I know the island itself doesn't have any predators to worry about. Her next step is to secure the four basic provisions she'll need for survival, a water source, food, a fire, and shelter. This island appears to be a blanc, so I would walk through the center of the island long ways to double check that there isn't a creek or water hole. If there wasn't a water source, I would be careful to save the coconut shells to collect rainwater, or consider building a solar water still, which Jen could do with the fabric and the cooler she finds at the campsite. After the walk, I would immediately take stones and sticks to spell out SOS on the beach for passing planes to see, and I would make two fires, one smaller for cooking and warmth by my camp, and a larger signal fire away from the tree line for boats to easily spot like lighthouse. Even the light from a normal candle can be seen from up to 1.6 miles away. A bonfire emits even more light, but its visibility is limited by the curvature of the earth. A plane or boat could still spot it from many miles away at night. Making sure we're visible to passer buyers so we can get off this rock is the priority, especially with the meat-eating merman hunting big game on this island. Back on the beach, Jen hears noises coming from a rotten log and gets jump-scared by a blue macaw. Hmm, 
I wonder if this log is gonna come in handy later. The first night, Jin lays out some coconut shells in the thermos to catch rainwater and wraps herself in the tent material she found at the campsite. In the morning, she finds that the storm washed dozens of fish up on the shore. She gathers them into her backpack, ultimately finding a shark with its tail torn off and giant cut marks across its body. That mangled shark isn't an uplifting sight. With no sign of rescue or carnivorous creatures yet, we need to focus on keeping ourselves fed and prepared for anything. Fish are Jen's main source of food here, so gathering a load of them is smart. Although, I might use the cooler from the campsite to hold them, instead of gunking up a good backpack. Since Jen doesn't know how long she's going to be here, she needs to think about how to catch fish herself without relying on storms to do it. She eventually fashions a pointy stick, which is good, but spearfishing is inconsistent, can be dangerous, and can expend loads of energy. Instead, I would probably try creating a fishing weir, in which you gather sticks and create a little fence in the water with an opening for the fish to swim in. And once a fish enters, you can close the exit and collect the fish. It's staple buttons easy. As for the torn up shark, it looks freaky, but it could easily be explained away by a run in with a boat propeller. I wouldn't immediately jump to a predator attack without more to go on. Manatees tragically get hit by boat propellers all the time. Sometimes the marks are precise and obviously look mechanical. Other times they look like claw marks. But yeah, this, this isn't a good sign. Jen tries to clean a fish, destroying it in the process. Next, she tries and fails to open a clam, banging it on a rock. While wandering through the island, she finds the graveyard for the campsite she found, where at least three bodies are buried. This inspires her to bury Brad's body on the beach. He's already starting to smell. She drags him away from her camp, digs a foot deep hole in the sand, covers him in palm fronds, and buries him. As night falls, she wedges a stick between the two trees and drapes the tent material over it for shelter, then builds a small fire and roast the fish. Okay, the family not making it out of here alive is a bit demoralizing. What else can we do but try? If there's such a thing as an ideal stranding, it'd be one where you have a knife on you to clean fish and kill sea monsters. Since Jen doesn't have a knife, she'll need to use a bit more finesse if she wants to eat. She could break one of the coke bottles she found in the campsite cooler, or just use the rock with a sharp edge. But, you know, better. To properly clean the fish, lay it out on a leaf and scale it by taking a firm hold of the tail, setting the rock edge at a slight angle and scraping from tail to gills. Once those slide off, place the fish on a clean leaf and gut it by carefully making a shallow cut along the fish's belly from right above the anal gland up to the neck. The cut needs to be shallow to avoid cutting into the intestines, which will spoil the meat. To avoid that, use the sharp edge to cut around the anal gland and remove the intestines whole. At that point, she could then go ahead and spear the fish and cook it over the fire, head and all. As for Brad's body, she should have done this on day zero before he started to rot, but better late than never. Dragging him from the camp is a good way to keep predators from entering, although it feels like for the amount of energy she's wasting, it would have been easier to bury him there and move camp instead. The other option here is for the people who play survival games on hard difficulty. She could always use that meat as bait for fishing. Yeah, cannibalism too, but it's a little early for that. Dr. Lecter, we have plenty of fish to keep our stomach full. On day two, Jen discovers that something has dug up Brad's body and torn it apart. Jen fashions a pointy stick for defense and stands guard all night, watching the jungle for signs of predators. Jen is right to be scared when she finds Brad's body's been dug up, torn apart, and dragged away. Fiji doesn't really have any large land animals that could do this, and most of the scary things live in the ocean, like sea snakes, sharks, Irokanji jellyfish, and saltwater crocodiles. Crocs have been known to eat human remains when the body's left out in the open, but they only dig to lay their eggs. The only things that could have dug up the body are either mongrel dogs or humans or something worse than both. Jen fashions a spear and stands guard, but if I were in her shoes, I would make as many spears as I could before nightfall and climb into the tallest tree I could find to spend the night. At the very least, I'd rig a circle of outward facing spikes around my camp. On day three, Jen spots floating debris a few hundred yards offshore. It's her suitcase and an ice bucket. She peers below the water and discovers a massive hole in the ocean floor, with a current pulling sand down into it. She returns to the beach and investigates the suitcase, but it only contains clothing. Later that night, Jen finds a hidden compartment in the box from the campsite with pictures of the stranded family and eyes of a creature watching the family in the dark. She hears a plane and fumbles 
fumbles trying to find, load, and fire the flare gun. She finally manages to fire it into the sky, but too little too late. Instead of grabbing the plane's attention, she grabs the attention of the sea beast. It's watching her too, just offshore. Jen hides in the jungle with her spear as the monster searches for her. It gets way too close for comfort, but it doesn't find her. The only thing worse than being stranded in the forest full of mutated freaks and cannibals is having this fishy behemoth as your stalker. Back before the sea beast spotted Jen, her seeing the hole off the shoreline like this wouldn't necessarily be cause for concern. Underwater sinkholes are appearing in the ocean all the time, especially as arctic water melts. I'd be more worried about the current it's pulling in. That might make swimming offshore dangerous. Best to avoid the giant underwater suck holes either way. Once we know the beast is out there though, it's time to move camp ASAP. In the morning after the beast has retreated, I would mark the hole's location with a branch on the beach, then move to the other side of the island. Sure, there may be offshore holes on that side, and it can swim anyways, but I'd be trying to put as much distance between me and this thing to test the limits of its territory and whether or not it will go out of its way to find me again. It's already attacked Brad's body, so it has a taste for human flesh. In this first encounter, going inland and hiding is probably Jen's only option, but hiding on the floor under a brush like this is risky. It's why a full survey of the island, both the perimeter and the central forest, would have been useful. She would have seen tall trees with sleeping crooks in them, and found more potential hiding places like the rotten log. She's just lucky the sea beast stopped looking for her here. The first encounter also tells us a couple things about the beast. The first is that it's amphibious, able to breathe in water as well as on land. This may mean it has both gills and lungs, like a lungfish, or that it can breathe through its skin like like frogs can. This may mean it's more susceptible to poisons and pollutants, including fire smoke. Jen could test its tolerance and reaction to fire by building a large one and seeing how it reacts the next night. The second thing is that it doesn't seem to have heightened senses, not consistently anyway. It sniffed out Brad's body under the sand, finds her in two hiding spots later, and has no problem finding food she hangs out for it, but can't seem to locate her here 10 feet from it in the jungle. It seems to rely on its sense of sight to find her out in the water. Moving Moving to the other side of the island would be helpful because the beast appears to be watching her. This may mean we can avoid it by just staying out of reach up in a tree. To this point, it also appears to be nocturnal, only coming out at night. We could start sleeping during the day so we can stand guard when the sun goes down. Jen should also have that flare gun loaded and ready to rock just in case opportunity strikes. Fumbling for it when a plane is overhead is a great way to make your residence here permanent. A plane going by on the first and third night is super good news and likely means there's decent plane traffic through this area. Just wait until you can fire ahead of Barry Seal's next fly through here. You'll be having your welcome back seafood buffet luncheon in no time. On the morning of day four, Jen tries to fashion a flotation device to get off the island by tucking her and Brad's life vest inside the suitcase, then trying to board it like a raft. It doesn't work. All it does is make her look about as graceful as a golden retriever trying to drown its owner. As the sun sets, Jen tucks herself in and her spear inside the rotten tree on the beach to wait out the creature. At night, the sea beast comes. It tries to claw its way into the side of the trunk, but quickly gives up. I admire her hustle here, but both attempts to help herself are problematic. For one, the suitcase was already floating when she found it because of the air trapped inside. If she wants to use it as a flotation device, she can simply hold on while wearing one of the vests. The problem is that her feet would be dangling in the water, and she has no idea how far it is to rescue, or even the next island. She would be better off building a raft and then using the closed suitcase as an understructure flotation buoy so she can stand her sit out of the water and carry supplies with her. Still a terrible idea, and I'll go into why later. As for the rotten tree log, hiding inside puts the beast at a strategic advantage. The beast can attack this log from any direction, while Jen can only defend herself if it comes to the open end of the log. It would have been better to bury part of the log at an angle in the sand, and then use the cooler or fashion a small plate guard of spikes to cork the opening. Which brings me to the monster again. How did it not realize it could just walk over to the 
the end of the log where it's open and then grab her. This is great news. This fish head has got size and strength on us, but it's not exactly clever. We can exploit this. On day five, Jen takes proactive measures after she crawls out of the shredded tree. She catches minnows in a tide pool and crushes them into chum, which she uses to spearfish a black tip shark. That night, she hangs the shark up on the beach as a sort of offering to the sea beast and hides in a hole covered in palm fronds. The beast seems to accept her offering and leaves her alone. We've reached the tribal stage of our sieve development. Time to feed the old gods. Creating this chum is great. If she wants to use it to spearfish, more power to her. However, I might have rigged a fishing weir and used it there too to pull a double duty and save her energy just in case she has to fight. If she had chummed a weir, sharks would come anyways and she could trap multiple at once, meaning she wouldn't have to shark fish every day and she could use the extra time to either build a better monster trap or a better shelter. As for feeding the creature, this may be how the former family stranded on the island survived, at least for a while. It's not really a sustainable way to live long term. One bad fishing day and you're on the menu. However, it could give Jen enough lead time to experiment and devise a way to make it extinct. My initial go-to move is a signature special of feces tipped punchies in a punchy pit under the food, hidden with our tent material or just a bunch of palm fronds. Alternatively, a snare trap shouldn't be too hard to create. All we need is two sticks, one rope, and five logs. The problem is finding a counterweight big enough to haul this giant into the air. And, you know, we'd still have to kill it by hand while it's thrashing around. Although, one of my strats in the forest game was to leave a bonfire pile at the base of the snare trap. And once the freaks were strung up, all you need to do is flick a match at it. It's a snare and rotisserie all in one. Or, we could attempt to hurt the beast by stuffing the shark with jagged shards of coral or broken coke bottles so that when it bit down or swallowed it, its mouth or stomach would be damaged. If these remote traps weren't successful, we could rig a fire around a shark to see if it's afraid or vulnerable to fire. This would also let us see the beast in more detail and look for weak spots we need to hit if it comes down to close quarter combat. On day six, a body watches ashore wearing a life jacket. It's another member of Jen's party, Zack, who seems to have deep cuts to his neck and face, as well as, you know, being torn in half. Jen hangs Zack from the offering tree. That night, the sea beast feeds on Zack's body a few yards from Jen's camp, while she watches from a dugout with a leaf over her head. A plane cuts the feast short, and the sea creature suddenly rushes closer, seemingly to either prevent Jen from firing off another flare, or to find her if she does. On day 7, Jen tears up the tent's material and fashions a hammock high up between two palm trees to keep her out of the sea beast's reach. At night, she peers out into the darkness to see the beast silently moving through the jungle towards her. Suddenly, it hits the palm trees, sliding the hammock ropes down and bringing Jen within reach. She tumbles out of the hammock and sprints for the beach. The beast follows. It plunges into the water and chases her down the beach, knocking her into the surf before disappearing. When Jen thinks the coast is clear, she manages to get up into the crook of a tree to wait out the rest of the night. What a waste of a lifeless body. She should have rigged it up as a trap like we discussed, and that leaf dugout was an awful hiding spot. While she couldn't risk popping a flare with a creature right next to her, that doesn't mean she couldn't have signaled the plane another way. She's already witnessed two flyovers at night. Chances are, the dude flying one way will eventually fly back the same way, or it's a frequently flown flight path. It's likely the monster begins its hunt right after sundown every night, which means the plane flyover is roughly around the same time. This is where your signal fires come into play. Light them up with enough fuel to last hours before sundown, and then go to your hiding spot. Rigging a hammock like this may sound like a good idea, but we've already seen that this beast is huge and strong, capable of ripping our shark offering clean off the rope. At least hang it up a lot higher and pin it to the sides of the tree so it won't slide down. And you're still going to want to keep feeding it offerings so it doesn't bother approaching your hammock in the first place. On day eight, Jen spots a life raft drifting offshore. She swims to it, discovering her boyfriend Lucas and friend Mia inside. She helps pull them ashore, then feeds them and gives them the soda from the cooler. She tries to tell them that they have to leave, that there's something dangerous about the island, but she botches the explanation, leaning too heavily on her visceral fear and random pieces of information that sound silly without context. They don't believe her and aren't willing to give up the cushy island. The raft was hell for them. Mia and Lucas try to convince her to light a fire to signal for rescue. Jen warns them they don't have time and tries to force them to leave, but they refuse. While Mia and Lucas are resting, Jen loads the cooler with fish and tries to steal the raft 
left right in front of her friends. A fight breaks out, and Mia knocks Jen unconscious by hitting her in the face with an oar. With friends like these, who needs a fish monster for an enemy? I don't know about you, but I very rarely have reasons to lie about being attacked by sea monsters. I definitely don't lie about it and then try to panic flee an island at the first opportunity. Attempting to steal the raft is ice cold. It'd be even colder to do it at nightfall when the creature is busy munching on our friends. Colder, but effective. At least until she dies from exposure on the raft or the monsters chase her down for dessert. I wouldn't leave if I were Jen. There's nothing out there. The island is a hunting ground, yes, but it's a manageable one. We have a steady, reliable source of food, water and shelter, regular plane flyovers, which we can signal, we can continue to offer up fish food to the monster to keep it happy and fed, and now we have strength in numbers. It is significantly easier for a plane to report an SOS from a mapped out island and initiate a rescue than it is to find a drifting life raft in the middle of the ocean. She also can't fish well from the raft, can't defend herself at all if a monster finds her, can't easily source drinking water, has no idea where she's going, and if the raft gets a tear in it, it's game over. She survived this long. She can make it through one more night. They want to build a signal fire, which is a good idea with the planes flying over her head at regular times. So, build a giant ass fire, hang up some bait, string up some beach chairs, pop some popcorn, and let them see for themselves. If you're going to steal the raft, obviously, don't do it in plain sight for everyone to see. It'll just piss them off and lose their trust. They might even kill you outright. Instead, Jen should be sneaky about it. She should apologize, tell them they need wood for a signal fire, wait for them to go into the forest, and then steal it. Or do your nightly routine to keep the monster at bay, then leave in the morning before they wake up. This also gives you a head start with a nocturnal monster sleeping. That night, Jen wakes up tied to a tree. Mia says it's been night for a while and nothing has happened yet, but refuses to untie her. Jen starts to saw through the rope. Lucas tries talking to her next, but won't untie her either. Nearby, Mia finds a fish head in the surf. She hears something behind her and screams. Lucas comes running with a torch and finds the sea beast chomping down on Mia's midsection like a ham sandwich. Lucas hits the beast and it drops Mia, but before Lucas can pull her out of the water, it drags her into the deep. Jen breaks through her rope restraints and pulls Lucas into the forest. Welp, told you so? If they were bent on staying on solid ground, all they had to do to survive was assume Jen was correct and play along for one night. It literally can't hurt for them to exercise a little caution on day one of being on a remote island. Jen might have been able to talk herself out of her restraints. While it might have been suspicious to suddenly change our tune, just telling Mia that she's sorry she was desperate to leave and panicked might get Mia to let her go. If it didn't, grinding the rope back and forth against the tree while they're not looking is the way to go, especially since we know this attack is coming. Mia is toast once the beast grabs her. I sure as am not going to run over to hold her hand while she gets dragged off into a sinkhole by a nine foot tall jacked mermaid. Like I said, all they had to do was assume Jen was telling the truth about a sea monster for one night and not go frolicking in the shallows looking for turtles. Ultimately, the only thing Lucas might have done differently here is aim the fiery end of the torch at the beast's gills, or head instead of just smacking it across the back. A headshot would do more damage and could potentially cripple it to the point that it went back to catching its own sharks. On day nine, Lucas is afraid to come out of the tree they slept in. Jen assures him she's never seen the beast out during the day. Jen catches and roasts fish, and Lucas stores coconuts in the cooler. Together, they push the raft into the ocean filled with their meager supplies. They climb aboard, and Jen gets a glimpse of what happened to Zack. The entire bottom of the raft is smeared with blood. Lucas begins to paddle. He recoils as something monstrous swims under the raft, raking its claws along it. It tears a hole through the raft bottom and pops its shark-like head in. Jen drop kicks it in the face with her Nike Freeze. Then Lucas fires two flares into its face, forcing it to retreat back underwater. Moments later, Jen is ripped through the raft by the beast. I told you so again. If not believing us was proof enough already, we shouldn't trust Lucas once we see the blood in the raft. That's not fish blood. That's enough blood that somebody died there. It's implied that Lucas killed Zack at some point. There's not much Jen can do about it now that they're in the raft paddling away, but I'd be keeping a close eye on Lucas moving forward. If he's not careful, I'd make him my next offering to the beast, since they didn't bring any sharks with them. As for the mermaid, if you know where he is, you know where he isn't. They should have prepared to leave by shark fishing and dangling several down the beach away from where they planned to set sail. It might not have gone for the distraction, but if it did, it would have given them a significant lead and maybe even
even kept it off their backs entirely. They could have also brought a shark or two with them and attempted to feed it once it came near the boat, but it might have begun to associate the raft with food and followed them into the open water. But really, setting sail on the raft was a dumb idea to begin with. Once the beast attacks, it's a bad idea to use flares, especially inside of closed environments like this raft. Flares burn hot enough to melt steel and make breathing difficult. They're also specifically designed to be hard to extinguish. All this is doing is setting fire to your raft while burning and poisoning yourself. Also, you're going to miss those flares when you could have used them to signal a passing boat or plane. Instead, once the beast shows its head through the hole in the floor, they should both be stabbing it repeatedly with their pointy sticks that they should have brought. At this point, there's a hole in the raft and they probably have to return to shore anyways. What matters now is incapacitating this predator. The merman drags Jen towards the ocean. We finally see him. He's gigantic, muscular, and at least nine feet tall. He seems to look like what would happen if Aquaman started hanging out with sharks a little too much. Jen screams in fear, but manages to keep her head on straight long enough to pull out Lucas's pocket knife and stab the sea beast in his ribs, causing it to let her go. Suddenly, up above, Lucas dives out of the raft with a spear. It tackles Lucas, knocking the wind out of him, dragging him into his watery grave in the black hole. Jen's lucky she had the pocket knife on her. They both really should have had short, pointy stick knives in hand in addition to their peasant spears. The long spears are too unwieldy in the water. A makeshift dive knife is purpose made for this situation. If you weren't armed and in this position, you could try gouging out his eyes or tearing at his gills. Not hard to do being pulled at 10 miles per hour by Flipper though. Lucas jumping in was chivalrous, but probably less helpful than if he had, say, cut his arm and let blood dribble into the water to draw the beast's attention back towards the raft, a place from which he could have more easily stabbed it. And hopefully this is obvious, but if something grabs you, don't just let it drag you deep into a hole in the ocean. Fight back, tear, scratch, claw, kick. But really, for the 10th time, paddling into a carnivorous sea monster's natural environment with a couple sticks and a buoyant nylon tent was a tragically stupid decision. Jen swims back to shore to find the tattered raft beat her there. She quickly relights her fire before the last ember dies out, and then tries to make more spears, but when most of them break, she digs up the family's body in the graveyard and uses a stone to make shivs out of their bones. At night, she sets a bonfire ablaze for the monster to see. It comes ashore to hunt her, but Jen is waiting. As it approaches, she triggers a ring of fire around the beast and stabs its gut with a spear. Using bone shivs and spears she placed all around the circle, she fights it, stabbing its gut and chest over and over again. Anytime she loses a shiv, she reaches for another. When the beast grabs her, she pulls her shiv from her waist and repeatedly stabs him in the chest. He tosses her aside and she runs towards her camp. When he goes to chase her, he's too wounded to fight. He collapses at her feet, still breathing. She pikes him through the head and decapitates him for good measure. This is like a Walmart version of Royce's showdown with a predator. To be expected though, Royce was a black ops mercenary and Jen is not. Her bonfire ambush is another example of Jen's great idea in lackluster execution. I've been saying all along that fire may be the key to killing this beast. Most things, living or inanimate, are vulnerable to fire. However, attacking a towering shark man head-on is dangerous. It's bigger, stronger, and faster than humans. I would have set my fire ring far away from the edge of the jungle so the flames couldn't leap over during the fight and destroy my only source of coconut water. I would have lured the beast into the circle and then set the circle on fire once it was trapped. Even better if we could cover the middle ground in leaf litter before he gets in there. There'd be a higher possibility of setting him ablaze. Once it jumps through the flames in desperation, throwing spears first would keep distance between it and us. And we could still have a fiery torch with us to keep him back until melee fighting was absolutely necessary. Jen needs to stab quickly and frequently at the beast's weak points, its eyes, its gills and neck, and its belly. A hearty stab and rip to its abdomen should at least put the rest of the fight on an even keel. Once she puts it down, she needs to be even quicker with a double tap to make sure. Don't go around and find out like Oberyn Martell. Decapitating it is a boss move though. Gotta get the evidence. I try to keep it as a trophy and taxidermy it to hang on my wall. My only other complaint is her nonchalance once the beast is dead. It's unlikely that there's only one creature, birds and beasts 
bees and all. Maybe the mermaids aren't hunters, but I'm not gonna assume that. Jen lives to fight another day. Of course, we pull out to discover her bonfire circle has spread to the jungle and the entire island is now ablaze. That's definitely the sort of signal fire Barry's bound to notice. Surviving on a jungle island comes down to food, water, shelter, and signal fires. Things get a little trickier when Shark Boy shows up to deal some damage. Jen got through the whole ordeal in one piece with a nifty monster head to take home as a souvenir. But there were plenty of moments when things could have gone wrong for her. Engaging the sea beast is really a last resort when you can't catch any more offerings for it or your punji pits have failed. I do think a well-executed punji trap would have effectively ended the creature preventing any deaths. Zack and Brad were screwed from the beginning. But if Jen had been a little more strategic with her explanation of the sea beast and had they been a bit less of stubborn assholes, her friends would still be alive too. All in all, I'd say the sea beast from Sweetheart was beaten. How would you have beaten Aquaman? Let me know in the comments. Hit the like button to hang up a shark for the merman. Hit the subscribe button to dig the punchy pit beneath it. Thanks for watching, and remember, don't try to fight amphibious predators in the water.